Should I do a cleanse? I hear people asking this question a lot. If you're hoping it will remove toxins from your body, that's just not gonna happen. You know, in the United States, it didn't become law that, uh, that you had to have women in studies until 1993 right after I graduated medical school, right? So, so we have a lot of gaps and those are the problem of medicine in our society. So my one hack is if you're looking up women's health information, put whatever question you have in your toolbar or in your search bar and then put SOGC, Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, because that will force everything that's SOGC content to come to the top. And it's a total game changer for um, getting your information. Hello, I'm Michael Benarosh, president of the University of Manitoba. Welcome to season two of my podcast, What's the Big Idea? I'm excited to share more conversations with big thinkers from the UM community who are contributing to the cultural, social, and economic well being of Manitoba, Canada, and the world. Together, we'll unpack the big ideas their work explores with topics ranging from health research to climate science, to social justice, there's something for everyone. In today's episode, guest host, University of Manitoba's Chancellor, Anne Mann, is speaking to arguably the most trusted and most entertaining authority on women's health, UM alum, Dr. Jen Gunter. Jen is not only a world-renowned gynecologist, but also a pain medicine physician and a New York Times best-selling author of The Vagina Bible and The Menopause Manifesto. In this conversation, she shares her mission to correct the masses of misinformation on everything from menstruation and menopause, and she explains how women's health is still weaponized for profit, even while accurate information is easier to access than ever before. I'm thrilled to start season two of What's the Big Idea with this important discussion. Enjoy. You are a candid advocate for women and science who began reading works by great feminists when you were age nine, rode your bike to your first pro-choice protest at 15, and graduated from medicine at U of M at age 23, which is a little on the early side, I might say. All right, let's launch in. Yeah, my 10 speed riding down to the Morgan Fowler Clinic. <laughs> so welcome home. Thank you. You're the internet's most famous gynecologist, and you've earned the title by unapologetically confronting the patriarchy in women's health and debunking bad science. What's the big idea you've been thinking about lately, Jen? Well, I think the big idea is that we're still dealing with a lot of the same misinformation we were dealing with when I was a girl. And how are we at this point where every single person has a pocket computer, basically, right? We all have all knowledge of all time at our fingertips, and yet we're still dealing with disinformation. And to me, that's a really kind of astounding thing, because I kind of thought when I first started getting active online from a combating disinformation thing, I thought, I'm going to fix this, no problem at all. We're going to get some good information out there. And obviously that, that's not the case. And so I just think the stickiness of disinformation, but specifically how disinformation about women's health is weaponized. The fact that we've made some inroads, but not as much as I thought. I think that we need to be aware. My idea would be that we still have a long way to go. Mm. We're going to unpack that topic a little bit, but we're going to talk about the internet and information on it a little bit later in our conversation. In 2019, you gave an interview with The Guardian where you said the patriarchy views the inside of women's bodies as dirty. What do you mean by this, and what is the impact of this on women's health? Yeah, so if you go back to the beginnings of medicine in Greece, you know, certainly the idea that women had troublesome physiology and men were perfect. You know, the idea that menstruation was excess fluid. We couldn't keep ourselves in balance. And so that was a sign of that. And of course, men were perfect and they could. And so that became weaponized as being dirty and toxic. And, and of course, when you don't have words and science to explain things, that's part of the explanation. But, you know, they also 
believed that when you were pregnant, where did that extra fluid go? Well, that went to your breasts and became breast milk. And you're like, really? Has anybody like, ever like looked at breast milk and looked at blood and been like, really? You really think those two are the same thing? Like, Because, you know, in the time of ancient Greece, they figured out the earth was round. So if you're smart enough to figure out that the earth is round and you know the curve of the earth, you're smart enough to figure that out and that you're like looking at menstrual blood and you're looking at milk and you're going, yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. That to me shows an absolute lack of curiosity about what's happening with the female body. That if you're curious enough, people are really smart and they can start to figure things out. And so it was just an absolute lack of interest. And then, of course, there's a huge crossover with religion. And so a lot of the same words that we see are words associated with purity myths, right? So a dirty vagina is one that's been used, one that's had sex. And so this all sort of became weaponized together to become the language that we use. And the fascinating thing is that if this language of purity culture has really been weaponized by the wellness community. Because if you remember, you know, medicine and religion was very intertwined until late 1800s. And so these words seem... I think familiar to us, and that's why we listen to them and think, oh yeah, I want to be pure, clean, and natural too. And it's like, well, maybe you might want to think about what that really means. Mm. Is there an unlearning that needs to happen on how we as women view our own bodies and our own health? I think so in a lot of ways, certainly in our culture, the messages that we're seeing. You know, just the other day, there uh, tri- I think she's a triathlete. She might be a marathon runner, may have it wrong. But she posted a picture and she's got blood on her swimsuit because her period either came early or whatever. And, you know, she posted it to try to make other women not feel bad if that happens to them. And here we are still having to do that. I mean, I think it's amazing she did it, don't get me wrong. But the idea that we still have to do that, it's like a normal bodily function. Like if you have a nosebleed, no one's going to be like, oh, you need to hide that. People will be like, oh, you're having a nosebleed. Wait, okay. Are you okay? So I think the idea that we still have to do that means that we still have a lot of conversations to have. Mm-hmm. Let's look at menopause within this context. I asked some of my friends in medicine what I should ask you, and they wanted to know, in your view, is menopause something to be supported or a medical state to be treated? So menopause is a normal physiologic event, like puberty, like being pregnant. But that doesn't mean that every normal physiologic event is also a bed of roses, right? So there's people who have pregnancies and they're like, oh my gosh, that's the best I ever felt in my life. And there's people like me who got sepsis, right? So we have these range of experiences. There's people who had awful puberties and terrible acne and they developed depression and other people who are like, I don't don't know, I don't remember anything. So we have these different experiences. And many of these things are also made worse because of the sort of constraints of a patriarchal culture. You know, if everything around you is geared towards people who aren't having hot flashes and you can't even talk about it and all that kind of stuff, that just makes it worse. And if your physiology hasn't been studied and, you know, in the United States, it didn't become law that you had to have women in studies until 1993 right, after I graduated medical school, right? So we have a lot of gaps, and those are the problem of medicine in our society. So what I would say to people is this is a normal event. There are people who sail through menopause and have no issues, and there's people who have problems. And that's the great thing about modern medicine. We can have solutions for problems, or we can have help. And so just like if you developed acne during puberty, we would say, hey, you should get that treated. If you're having bothersome hot flashes, hey, we have treatment for that. And so I think we need to normalize it and also just say, hey, if you're suffering and need help, we should normalize asking for help as well. Mm -hmm. And I think on behalf of this whole group, I'm going to say thank you for working to normalize it for us women. There was a menopause commercial on during the Super Bowl, Mm -hmm. and it was like a big to-do because it was like, oh, there's a menopause product commercial. Right, right. And, you know, it's like, it's about time. We're half the population. Right. Yeah. How many ads have we seen of a football being thrown through a tire? Boy, that, there's, no, there's no imagery there at all, right? <laughs> Let's, <laughs> Let's talk about hormone replacement therapy, HRT. 20 years ago, there was a famous study which linked breast cancer and heart disease to HRT. This study is still impacting the use of HRT for symptoms of hot flashes and night sweats. On May 15th, the Canadian Medical Association Journal wrote about the high effectiveness of HRT. 
Talk to us about the benefits and drawbacks of hormone mm -hmm. replacement therapy. So menopausal hormone therapy is estrogen, and if you have a uterus, it also means a type of progesterone or progestin. And basically, it's very effective. You, have, you need the progesterone or progestin so you don't get cancer of the uterus. So that's why you don't need it if you don't have a uterus. And it's the most effective therapy for hot flashes and night sweats. And it can help with some other symptoms. Sometimes it's not as good for other symptoms. So for example, depression, mild depression in the menopause transition. It can sometimes help with joint pain. It's not great for that, but it can sometimes. And it can sometimes help for a few other things. But the only sort of approved indication is night, hot flashes and night sweats. And I think it might be approved in Canada for mild depression in the menopause transition. I'm not sure it's actually approved here. A lot of the studies actually came from here. And it can also prevent osteoporosis. And that, that's it. And so it's very good for those things. What unfortunately we're seeing now is it's everything has come full circle. So when I was a resident, Estrogen was the fountain of use. We put every, like we put everybody on it. Oh, Mrs. Jones, you're 87 and you're here for an annual checkup. Let's get you started on some estrogen. Like I'm not kidding. We did that. We put everybody on it. She said, "Well, I'm fine. Oh, but you'll just live longer." Okay, dear. Like seriously, these were like the conversations we had. We gave it to everybody. We basically kind of medicalized menopause, but it was about longevity, right? But now it's kind of come round again as being offered as the fountain of use, and we're seeing all these online hormone clinics pop up with really incorrect information and people getting escalating doses much higher than were studied. So I can tell you it's a very safe medication within the confines of the populations that have been studied. But so there are people are giving it to people who've had breast cancer, people are very high risk for heart. So it's getting used in a way that that is concerning. So these documents that have come out, like from the Menopause Society or from the Canadian Medical Association or the International Menopause Society, they're getting everybody to agree. And if you look at those guidelines, they match up in all the different countries. So follow the guidelines. Thank you. In May, this new drug, Fezolintent, was approved in the United States by the FDA for hot flashes and night sweats. I understand that it's not estrogen-based. And what are your thoughts on it? It's great. It's great to have options. I have a lot of uh, people who follow me on social media who've had breast cancer who can't take hormones for other reasons, and they really feel that they've been left out of the conversation. There's so many people who are practicing menopause, but they're really just hormone providers. They're not looking at the holistic aspect of medicine. They're not looking at how much exercise are you getting, what's your diet, what are all these types of things. I always tell people if there's only one thing you can do in menopause, it's exercise. That's the thing that touches everything. So I think it's great to have options. I think it's a good drug. It's going to be obviously expensive, but that's a political issue, not, you know, not a medical one. Although obviously access is the medical issue. I'm excited to try prescribing it and to see how people do. Mm -hmm. So switching gears a little bit, how should we advocate for ourselves if our GP is not knowledgeable on women's health issues or is not taking our symptoms seriously? Well, lots of people tell me that my books are super helpful. I mean, I hate to put in a plug, but, um, <laughs> but I'll do it anyway. Uh, so yeah, I think that the best answer to that is actually being armed with information and going in and saying, you know, not just I read this, but I read this in this source. Because, you know, a lot of times people come in and they say, well, I read this in this source. I'm like, okay, well, that's, a, that's not a correct source. And this is where I would go to get that information. But if you say, look, you know, this comes, comes from, you know, the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada. This comes from, you know, pick a, you know, a source that's valid and comes in. You know, you can go far. I mean, I still remember a few years ago, this was one of the greatest comments on a blog I wrote. I wrote this blog about why you can have an IUD if you've never been pregnant. And this was like 10 years ago. And it's been common knowledge for a long time, but in the States especially, there's all these like medical legal issues and there's no explanation for it except that people aren't up to date. And I wrote this big post and this girl who's like, nine, I think she said she was 19, she said, yeah, I just want to thank you because I went to my doctor and I asked for an IUD and he wouldn't let me have one because I'd never been pregnant. She goes, and I came prepared. I printed out your blog and I slammed it down on the table and said, well, Dr. Jen Gunter says I can and she got her IUD. Okay, very good. So people shouldn't have to do that, but you know, it's good to be informed about everything that you're doing. And I will just note if anybody doesn't follow Jen on social media, everybody should. There's, you write a lot, you give a lot of very good information. So the next question is about misinformation. It's kind of the flip side of what we've already talked about, but I think it's worth asking. There's a lot of misinformation on the internet about women's health, from supplements all the way to jade eggs. 
How do the rest of us, without your training, assess the quality of information out there? And it's one thing to be able to access from you information we know is sound, but how do we know about all the rest of it if we happen to see things and wonder about them or think they look like a possibility? Yeah, so there's a couple of, you know, and this applies to almost everything in medicine, but I would say like red flags, that if you see these red flags, you get to get off the site. Because studies tell us that it just takes exposure to misinformation once to actually start to get you to think that you're going to believe it. It's so hard to unring the bell. So, so one of my red flags is, do they sell supplements? So would you go to a pharmaceutical company website and get information about an antidepressant? No, you probably wouldn't. So if they're selling, they're actively selling supplements, that's not a valid source of information. You should always think about a supplement as an unregulated pharmaceutical and use it from that standpoint. Another great red flag, and it's really hard because we all want there to be basically magic, is that if they're talking about a secret that your doctor won't tell you or a secret that no one knows, and, or if it's a celebrity, they do not have medical secrets, that there's no medical secrets. Like if that was true, if that fantastical information they're telling you is true, that would be a medical discovery. How do these people who've published nothing know this thing, but everybody else doesn't because there's a huge, huge overlap with wellness and conspiracy theory thinking, huge overlap. And there was a fascinating study done, uh, I don't know, five or six years ago where they surveyed people and they found out that the more conspiracy theories you believe, the more likely you are to buy supplements. It's really fascinating. And so, so wellness needs supplements. That's the wheel that churns. You know, people make, you know, I wrote recently about a supplement which is useless for the liver. It's not going to help you at all. Your liver, oh, detox. Oh, my God. If you see that word on a supplement, it's a total red flag. I, on any page, like, get off it. Like, right away, it's contaminated. Close it down to detox your liver. And the people who have come up with this supplement are claiming that by year two, they're going to be making more than $10 million. Right? Like, it's just... Like people are making millions and millions and millions of dollars like hand over fist. Mm. Let's talk a bit about the internet and social media. Your straightforward and honest approach has rubbed some of the medical community the wrong way. You're also the target of many internet trolls. Why do you think sharing science-based medical information about women's health needs garners such extreme reactions? So I think one part of it is there's a lot of money involved. So a lot of people I'm writing about are involved with the supplement industry and they're making hundreds of millions of dollars. They make a ton of money off this stuff. So I think there's that aspect of it. And I think there's this, and I'm sure everybody in this room has experienced it, that if you are a woman and you're explaining something that you are an expert in, you're too loud, you're too forceful, you're, you know, can't you say it nicer? And I'm like, nobody ever says that to men. And I'm like, you can think what you want, you can, you're wrong. And so about, I guess it was like eight or nine years ago when you know Gwyneth Paltrow and Goop wrote this really like nasty thing about me. I thought it was hilarious. So I was like, really? That's the best you came up with? Oh my God, like I've had better, like I, I, my kids have given me better insults. What is, <laughs> seriously, you put no effort into this. And you know, they, they said I was strangely confident. And the person who apparently was confident was the person selling jade eggs, which was a total scam anyway, because of course I followed it up with a research study to show it. And I wrote back, I said, I'm not strangely confident. I'm appropriately confident. And people have problems with an appropriately confident woman, right? And I'm like, I spent my whole life studying this. I was writing something about infectious diseases, which I had fellowship in. Like, what do you even, like, I'm not going to back down, and I'm not being overconfident. This is the appropriate level of confidence. And I think that because of the way that we are policed, uh, how we speak, we're made to feel that our, like, we're like, you know, we shouldn't be claiming our confidence. And so, yeah, I like, I, I could care less what people think about that. Do you think the internet and social media are making information access better or worse? And what is their global impact on truth? Yeah, I think 
so I think it's the, there would be the ideal world where everybody would have access to quality information, the Star Trek future, you know, where the computer is never going to lie to you and everybody just has goodness at their heart, except the villain of the week, right? But the reality is, is there's a lot of people out there trying to make money. There's a lot of people who think they know better. When the vaccine came out, there were like Russian troll farms out there, or bot farms, you know, creating misinformation. I think that what we need to do is teach people how to use it better. So like a car can be a terribly dangerous weapon if you don't know how to use it. And when you know how to use it, it's an incredibly useful tool. And so I kind of think of the internet that way, that if you stumble into it and don't understand how to search for things, you don't understand how to look for quality information, you can end up with really bad stuff. But if you go in and you know how to set your search up so you can get the information that you need and you know which sites are safe to look at, it can be an incredible source. I read about this professor who did this amazing assignment with his students, because now we have chat GPT, right? It's a whole mm -hmm. other level of disinformation. And what he did was he had the students, he gave them an essay prompt and he required them to do the essay in ChatGPT. And the assignment was for them to then critically analyze the essay. And basically they were all left with, oh my God, ChatGPT is terrible. And look at, all, look at all the errors and all that kind of stuff. And it was really an incredible teaching tool. And so I just thought, wow, that's like a really, really powerful way to teach it. So yeah, I mean, ChatGPT, we've got a lot of stuff coming down the pipeline we have to be worried about. So my one hack is if you're looking up women's health information, put whatever question you have in your toolbar or your search bar, and then put SOGC, Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, because that will force everything that's SOGC content to come to the top. So right away, you've pushed all their content to the top. You know, or you can put ACOG, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, you can put my name, you can put the Jet League. So pick what you, once you know some reliable sources, put your question in, and then put the reliable source in, and it's a total game changer for um, getting your information. Very good. That's my big take home tip. You're launching your fourth book early next year. I think you said January. January 23rd. It's, it's on menstruation. What can you tell us about it? Yeah, so it is, uh, it's called Blood, the Science, Medicine, and Mythology of Menstruation. And it is everything that I want people to know biologically about how their bodies work and how to use that information for navigating information that you'll, you read online. Like, I bet most people don't actually know why they menstruate. Right? Like people, most people think it's to do with the blood and it's not, the blood's actually a byproduct. It's all related to a process called decidualization, which is getting the lining of the endometrium ready. And it's uh, basically, if you are a mammal that has menstruation, you have spontaneous decidualization, meaning that the lining is there ready for the embryo. And there's all kinds of cool immune interactions that happen. The endometrium actually senses embryo quality. So all that, I mean, you've probably all heard that, you know, something like you know, only 20 or 30% of fertilized eggs actually implant. And that's because everything about evolution is geared for success because being pregnant, having a child, getting a child till it's old enough to survive is a massive biological effort. And so evolution wants to give you the best chance. And so having that endometrium ready to go is what actually is the important thing. So if you don't get pregnant or if the pregnancy is not of sort of sound quality, that evolution basically said, well, okay, you're just going to have to deal with the blood. Because once you have all that thick endometrium, it's the, the only way to get rid of it is come out. I always tell people it's like baking a souffle. So if mammals that menstruate, uh, when you get the endometrium ready, it's exactly like baking a souffle, and there's that like one minute of time where it's perfect to eat, that's the time of implantation. But if you want to then bake another souffle, the only way you're gonna get rid of that stuff is by cleaning out the pan, that's the only way. But if you're an animal that doesn't menstruate and you have estrus, the souffle is only baked once the pregnancy happens. So we have spontaneous decidualization and other animals don't. So there is not a conception. There's no thick endometrium to get rid of. And so that's why they don't menstruate. And so I would say choice is coded into the system for oh. mammals who menstruate. So that's kind of the first chapters explaining all of that and how we know that. And, you know, you think about the biology lessons that kids are taught in school and, you know, they know more about frog biology than they do about their own.
Let's take a few questions if there are any. I'd love to hear from the audience. Thank you so much for everything that you shared. During your talk, you had mentioned having to constantly sort of prove yourself. But I'm just wondering, how do you develop that appropriately confident self? You know, I think part of it is I literally have been blessed with it not caring what other people think. Like I really, I think it's a sense of self and realizing that what matters is what I think about. You know, did I try to hurt somebody on purpose? No. Um, am I, you know, am I saying the right thing? Am I accurate? And and trusting myself. And I think that, you know, the people who don't ask those questions are always the people who, you know, should be asking them, right? You can get better at everything with practice. It's just start saying it. Just start speaking up in, in areas that maybe feel more comfortable for you or safer, but practice, really practice saying it, practice, you know, owning it, say it in front of the mirror. And if somebody makes a face, a guy, because it's always going to be a guy, you know what? Don't let a drop say, what's the matter with you? What, like, what's your problem? People are afraid of confrontation, and obviously you don't want to do that in a position where you feel that might be unsafe, because that's obviously a different situation. But like, you know, I have had men smirk at me, and I literally say right back to face, what's the matter with you? Come on, let's hear it out right now. What did I say that's not correct? Because I want to learn. You have something you can teach me? Come on, go ahead. And, you know, I always shut up. So, um, so, you know, and I, so I think it's trusting your education. I think it really comes down to that. Well, thank you for sharing your wisdom tonight. And thank you for coming to Winnipeg. I, you can, you can leave Winnipeg, but you clearly can't take the Winnipegger out of you. Yeah. And I love that about you. And, um, we're just so grateful that, that we could have this conversation tonight. So thank you, Jen. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to What's the Big Idea? If you enjoyed this episode, share it widely and please rate and review the series. We read and appreciate all comments. I also want to thank Chancellor Anne Mann for guest hosting this episode. I'll be back next time with Professor Negan Sinclair. He is Anishinaabe and head of the Department of Indigenous Studies at the University of Manitoba. You'll learn so much from this powerful conversation on truth and reconciliation. For more information about the university and our global impact, visit umanitoba.ca. Another Everything Podcast production. Visit everythingpodcast.com. Subscribe. Where